did Nansen write the diary in the first place? Of course, writing a diary in a concentration camp is a very, very dangerous undertaking. If he ever got caught with this, could easily have been executed for it. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, Nansen was, had, was and had been a diarist ever since he was a teenager. He'd been writing, keeping a journal. In fact, I've seen his journals going all the way back to when he was about 15 years old. <clears throat> so it was pretty natural for him to want to keep writing a diary. It was kind of in his blood at the time. He was used to it. And he said, I, he writes in his foreword, he says, I never wrote this diary with the intention that I was ever going to publish it at any time. He says, I wrote it for two people primarily. I wrote it first for myself. And he writes, writing in my diary was like confiding in a close friend and relieving my mind of all that weighed on it. It became a private manner of forgetting. So I think if Nansen could write down what was going on, then he didn't have to kind of mentally revisit or rehash these events. Somebody gave me a great analogy recently. They said, you know, when you're, when you're about to go grocery shopping, if you write down a list of what you need, then you forget about what, what it is that you need. You don't have to have it in your brain. You just consult your list and get it. Now, what will be to you if you lose your list? Then you've got to kind of mentally recreate the whole thing. But I think that was part of it. And the other reason why I think, or the other reason why Nansen, in fact, mentions for writing the diary was he wanted his wife, Kati, to know what was going on. Now, he could write her letters while he was a captive, at least while he was in Norway, and also to a lesser degree in Germany. She could write her, him letters. She could occasionally, while he was in prison outside of Oslo, in a prison called Grini, she could occasionally get permission to come visit him. But every letter that he wrote and every letter that she wrote was censored. Somebody was reading everything that they wrote. And even their visits were limited to only 10 or 15 minutes. They could not touch each other during the visit. And there was always a guard in the room who could speak Norwegian. So they, he could listen in on, on what was going on. In fact, here's a nonsense sketch of what is, he calls the visit. There's his wife and the children behind the barrier. The guard has his hand up. He's saying, don't get any closer, whatever it might be. So the diary was his way, nonsense way, of really explaining to her what was really going on, things that he could never put in a letter because they'd be censored out. And so he writes to her, in fact, many of these diary entries begin with the words, you know, dear Kari, listen to what just happened today. I've got to write this down uh, while my memory is still fresh. And many, many of his diary entries end with the words, good night, Kari. Now in his mind, as he's writing the diary, he's mentally telling her, the story of what's going on. So let me share with you a couple of his diary entries about his wife. Because of course, as you can well imagine, he misses her more than anyone else. He, he mentions his wife, Kari, more than any other person in this diary. This first diary entry is from May 23rd, 1942. And Nansen, when he's writing this diary, is himself in solitary confinement. He was being punished by the Germans at the time because they caught him writing a poem which they considered to be anti-German. So they threw him in the slammer as a way of punishing him. So Nansen writes, I wonder where Kari is today. Is she sitting alone as well? She must be unhappy for my sake. She must have heard by now that I'm, quote, inside, meaning that he was in solitary. But I'm writing, dear Kari, soon all these horrors will be over. and We shall live together again and be happy. I can't do anything without you, not even be in prison. Now, when he writes these words, these hopeful words, soon we'll be together again, soon we'll be happy, soon life will be great again, he's been in prison for all of four months. What he, of course, doesn't know and couldn't know is that it'll be another 35 months before he finally gets out of prison and gets reunited with his wife. So compare the tone of that diary entry with one that he writes now two years later. In fact, he writes it on August 27th, 1944, which is gonna be the day of their wedding anniversary. And this is what he writes. Today is our wedding day, 17 years. The third wedding day in prison. So in a way that only makes 14, but 14 bright, rich years that have made it possible for me to get through these three dark ones. Life has been good to us after all. The wealth that has given us these 17 years, no one can take from us. It is of eternity and will never die, even though we should never meet again. 
So you can see where he's beginning to contemplate. He just may never get home alive. The war just seems to go on forever and ever. He thought that in 1942, in his diary entries, he keeps talking about how the war will end by the end of the year. And then when 43 starts, he says, well, the war has got to end this year. Now, here it is, August of 44, and the war, if anything, is being fought more intensely than ever. It seems like the war will never end. And of course, the longer you spend in a concentration camp, the greater your chances of running into bad end. You know, if Nansen gets on the wrong side of one guard and that guard decides to shoot him, no one would even ask the guard to justify or explain what he did. There are, there are no rules inside these concentration camps. Whatever the guards do is perfectly fine. Every single prisoner is expendable. Nansen could easily fall victim to an infectious disease. Now, here we are worried about the coronavirus. And there, there were every kind of disease in the world was circulating. One of the worst ones was typhus, because typhus is um, very prevalent where you have overcrowding because it's, it's carried by lice, and everybody had lice in them or carried them on them in their clothes. And by 1945, Nansen is living in a barracks originally designed to hold 200 prisoners. It now holds 800 prisoners. These people are literally living on top of each other. So you can see where Nansen is beginning to lose hope when he's ever going to see his wife again. Now, why was Nansen arrested in the first place? As I mentioned, he was arrested on January 13th, 1942. Well, he was arrested in retaliation for a British commando raid against Norway that occurred a few weeks before that, in late December 1941. In fact, it, it started on Boxing Day, December 26th, and carried over until the 27th. These highly trained British commandos land on the coastline quickly blow up a number of factories, fish oil processing plants, which were being repurposed by the Germans into making, using fish oil to make glycerin and then glycerin to make explosives. So they wanna destroy these to, to weaken the war effort. These commandos shoot and kill a number of German soldiers who are guarding the factories. They also take a couple of Quislings, uh, members of the National Zampling Party back with them as captives and disappear 48 hours later. They're all gone, all gone, all heading back to, to England. And this drove the man who was in charge of Norway for Hitler, his name was Joseph Terboven, drove him insane with fury that the British could pull this off without getting punished. And he was even more angry at the royal family, which he felt had somehow put the British up to this. And of course, he can't get back at the royal family because they're all living in exile in Great Britain and in Norway. So he says, the way I'm going to get back at the royal family is I'm going to arrest 20 of the most prominent citizens in this country who have some connection to the royal family. And I'm going to hold them as hostages. And that way, if things get out of hand, I always have the ability to take out a revenge against the most important people in this country. So Nansen fits the bill. He's famous. It's his father, Fritjof Nansen, who had brought uh, Prince Carl of Denmark over to Norway in 1905 to become the, the uh, king, King Haakon VII, who was still the king during World War II. So Nansen, the royal physician, the royal chamberlain, all these people get picked up and they're not charged with a crime. They're not sentenced, they're just held as hostages. And that's uh, how Nansen ends up in prison. Now, another reason why I think Nansen ended up in prison was he was a, a bitter enemy of Viken Quisling, who of course you all know quite well. And I won't go into the whole history of why the two people did not get along, but they had been bitter enemies forever. And of those 20 individuals who were arrested in uh, mid-January 1945 as hostages, over the remaining course of the war, 19 of them were released for various reasons. The only person who never was released was Odd Nansen. And although I've never been able to find any documentary proof of this, I am fully convinced that it was Quisling who made sure that Nansen never got out of prison. It was his way of getting his revenge against the man who had always been a thorn in his side. But I think if you read Nansen's diary, which is pretty detailed, and you, you really get a feel for what his personality was like, I think you almost have to come to the conclusion that even if the British had never attacked Norway, and even if Quisling had never been born, had never existed, that Nansen was gonna end up in prison one way or the other. And he was just one of these people who really wasn't gonna change his behavior to please the Nazis. 
And of course, there were so many ways you could get in trouble in occupied Norway. Singing the national anthem could get you arrested. Owning a radio could get you arrested. Listening to the BBC could get you shot. Trying to escape to England on the Shetland bus, which we talked about before this talk began, could get you shot. Uh, refusing to sit next to a German soldier on the bus or the trolley could get you arrested. And Nansen wasn't these, one of these people who was, as I say, going to change his behavior. In fact, at one point in the diary, Nansen talks about how he has been summoned to be interrogated by a Gestapo officer. And he wonders whether the, this person may be questioning him to see whether he uh, will permit Nansen to be released. And after he comes back from this interrogation, he writes in this diary, he said, the man who interrogated me asked his questions in such a cunning fashion that even silence on my part was a form of treason. And on no, on, under no circumstances would I agree to that. So I had to tell him outright, right to his face, how wrong he was. And if that has destroyed all my chances of ever being released early, well, then so be it. I mean, I think that's kind of the personality Nansen had. And I'm going to share with you a, a, a diary entry, which I think kind of incorporates this philosophy that Nansen worked uh, or operated under. In this diary entry, he's talking about a person in his barracks who has the title block tester. block tester is a German word. It means barracks leader. block tester was always a prisoner, almost always a German prisoner, who was given the authority by the Nazi guards, the SS, to keep order and discipline in the barracks. And as a result, these uh, block tests generally ended up being as vicious and as sadistic and as cruel as the SS guards were, if not more so, because that's, that's the only way they could keep their jobs. And of course, these jobs came with all sorts of perks. They didn't have to work. They got better food, etc. But Nansen says the block out tester in his barracks, a guy named Ludwig, was actually a very decent person. He says Ludwig wouldn't hurt a fly. Then he goes on to say this. He says Ludwig is one of the few who helped to preserve something in oneself which must not be lost. For it's not only the corpses of human beings which are burned and annihilated here, it's not only the young, strong bodies which have turned into musulmen, skeletons, and crematorium fuel. On this battlefield, the young faith and enthusiasm of thousands has gone under. The vital spark of thousands has been quenched in darkness and in brutishness. Ideals have vanished. Human kindness has turned to ice in many a heart. Faith in the future, the will and the force of good have withered up as the muscles wither up to useless dry tissue in the skeleton bodies of the Muslims. And then Nansen adds this one final sentence, which to me is the kicker. He goes on to say, of all the mass murders, perhaps this is the worst. Now, ever since I read that back in 2010, I've always puzzled over exactly what Nansen was trying to convey there. And here's a man who sees death and destruction on a daily basis, who writes in his diary how he has to straddle over a dead body in order to get into the urinal. And yet he's saying when human kindness turns to ice, when ideals vanish, that's the worst um, murder of all. And I still don't profess to know exactly what Nansen was getting at, but about a year ago, I was listening to an interview on NPR radio, and the woman who was being interviewed, her name is Esther, Esther Perel. She's a psychotherapist. She's the daughter of two Holocaust survivors. In fact, both her mother and father were the only surviving members of their respective families. She talks about growing up in a survivor family and knowing a lot of other Holocaust survivors, and she said, I could break down the people I met into two groups. Those people who after the war went on living and those people who simply did not die. And I think the distinction she's making there is if you're alive but you've lost your capacity to trust anybody, you have lost your capacity to love anyone, all the attributes of what it is to be human, then all you simply have done is not yet died, but you're not truly alive anymore. And I think holding on to your humanity is the most important aspect of all. I think Nansen is in fact saying your humanity in some ways is almost more important than your life. It's more important to keep that. And I think that's what Nansen was struggling with in these camps was to hold on to his own humanity. Now I used another German word 